welcome again to class and another lecture. Uh, today's lecture is actually uh, quite special because uh, you'll be the first class to uh, ever see this lecture. I just returned from an um, extended period of time, almost two months in uh, New Zealand, and uh, slipped over to Australia for a while. Uh, but basically, I was doing uh, on my sabbatical uh, research on the Maori people of New Zealand. So this lecture today is concerned with uh, this particular culture on the island of New Zealand. Uh, the Maori people are considered uh, part of the Polynesian culture, even though it's the only islands in the South Pacific that are not uh, near the, it's the furthest from the equator. Uh, so the climate is somewhat different, more temperate, uh, and that sort of thing. Uh, so anyway, uh, I should tell you that uh, I've never given this lecture before. Uh, normally when I record, I've given the lecture in the classroom before. So today is kind of an experiment. Uh, so if you'll forgive a few bumps uh, during the lecture, I would appreciate it. Uh, anyway, I hope you enjoy the lecture on uh, the Maori people. So let's get started. Uh, basically, we want to be aware of where these people come from. Uh, and you'll see basically that the Polynesian expansion uh, was probably, it was over a large area of the world, but it was all water, right? Um, so we, some people will call it the most dramatic burst of overwater exploration in human prehistory. Um, and New Zealand itself is one of the most isolated lands in the world. It's further from the equator than any other Polynesian island. Um, New Zealand, in fact, even though the Polynesians spread throughout the South Pacific and all the way up to Hawaii, um, New Zealand was hard to find. Um, but uh, those who know, uh, historians, um, cultural researchers and those things, tell us that somewhere in Central East Polynesia, such as the Society Islands or the Astral Islands is probably where they came from. So the early people say, sailed for basically thousands of miles over the ocean. Uh, the Maori people don't call New Zealand New Zealand. They call it uh, Oatearoa. Um, and this is actually the last place to be discovered and settled by Polynesian people. And this was even later than Hawaii. Hawaii is around 1200. Uh, so this is, a, Hawaii was around, I'm sorry, 800. Uh, New Zealand is around 1,200. Uh, what you're seeing behind me here is a actual, what they call a war canoe, uh, a Maori war canoe. Uh, between the islands, of course, the Maori people had the traditional battles that go on wherever people are. And uh, they, uh, they had these canoes that would go very, very quickly uh, and manned by, uh, 12 to 14 uh, rowers. Uh, so they would uh, go between islands uh, in canoes like this. So. Uh, they were brought with them the language, right? Uh, the religious beliefs, and of course the experiences of their forefathers. Um, and even though they came from tropical islands, uh, they were mountains here in New Zealand and vast amounts of land. Uh, you can imagine a people coming from very small islands and all at once they come up on this gigantic area. Uh, remember, New Zealand is about the size of California. Uh, New Zealand is not as populated as California. There's about four and a half million people in New Zealand today. But look at the connection here. Hawaiiki is a tra traditional and spiritual homeland of the Maori people. That's in their mythology, right? So there's some connection here between uh, islands. In other words, they bring with them the ideas. Uh, this is where the uh, Maori spirits return, according to mythology, uh, on their death uh, and they, from this world, okay? Hawaiiki uh, may be considered a spiritual place now, but it probably referred to a historical place that they came from, uh, perhaps the big island of Hawaii, um, in what, what you folks know as Hawaii. Uh, Savai'i in the Samoan group or Hawaii in the Society Islands. Uh, scholars have different ideas, but uh, this is, at this point in history anyway, this is where they think these people originated from. Uh, 
When they crossed oceans, uh, they basically had to bring with them everything. Uh, so the, the outrigger canoes were quite large. Uh, they used sails, uh, they used double hulls, the outrigger concept. And on the back of the canoe, they would have an area that could be covered. Uh, they brought with them livestock, pigs, dogs. Um, they brought with them planting materials and of course, lots of fresh water because they never knew how long it was going to be until they reached uh, the next island. Uh, so you can see basically, uh, I'll read through the quote for you. At first, as in the Western Pacific, hundreds of years earlier, a small and scattered population may have been held together by regular canoe voyages. As they become, well, I'll just talk about it. As they become uh, more established in their new lands, they lost this going back and forth idea. Um, so for many years, they believed that once the people got to New Zealand, uh, the Maori people, uh, they just stayed there. But recently they decided, no, no, no. Scholars have decided that uh, basically they did go back and forth. Um, so a lot of their, because a lot of their, uh, their oral tradition mentions uh, return voyages to the homeland. So lots of can be said about oral traditions in terms of actual history. Uh, this is, uh, well, myself standing uh, at a particular entrance to a Maori uh, cultural site. Uh, and you can see the type of carvings that are typically done among the Maori people. Um, and they often put them on entrances to community centers or villages, uh, or as this one was, a cultural center um, for people to go in, such as myself. Um, before the coming of the Europeans, uh, there was no written language, uh, of course. Knowledge, uh, mythology uh, were presented in what we call uh, Waiata and Huka. Waiata is kind of a singing tradition. Uh, huka is basically uh, a dance form. But in telling in the dance, there's also res uh, telling of stories, basically. Uh, and this is the way they preserve their cultures. This is what we'll call the archives of Maori culture. We, in a society with books, uh, archives are normally in libraries. Uh, in cultures with oral traditions, the archives are in the heads of people, passed on from generation to generation, which takes lots of memorization. Uh, and in terms of our class, uh, there's many, many stories that are similar throughout Polynesian. Uh, just for example, I ran across uh, the name Maui, which you have in your textbook, A Story on Maui. The people in New Zealand also know that. Uh, Tauroga, uh, the god of the sea, is mentioned in a lot of the stories. So it's similar to Tahiti, similar to Samoa, similar to Hawaii. Uh, so these stories are told all throughout the Polynesia. Uh, <laughs> this, I, I captured this picture. Uh, Basically, it's uh, the way of performing is to, uh, during the dancing, is to make the eyes big so the whites show, and also for the males anyway, to stick out the tongue. Uh, so where did this crazy thing come from? Well, uh, basically, uh, most of these things, these uh, dances anyway, are related to uh, tribal differences where there might be a war. Uh, the Maori people believe that uh, if you could make such an ugly face, you could actually scare your opponent and you wouldn't actually have to fight. And uh, I've read reports that say that uh, in actuality, um, there were often contests. Uh, one village would get their ugliest guy who could make the ugliest face and, and the other village would get their ugliest guy who could make the ugliest face and it would face off, they would have a a jury, sort of, so to speak, between the two villages. And whoever was able to make the ugliest face won the war. Uh, a very good way to fight, right? But here you can see it's, it's come down today in the form of a, of a dance, um, and it's incorporated. Uh, please remember that only the men are allowed to stick out their tongues. Uh, the women, uh, during the performances, can make their eyes bulge or make the white show. Uh, but uh, it's only the men who are allowed to uh, stick out their tongue, and it's done in every traditional dance. 
Uh, it, it matters not where you go in the islands, uh, you'll see this, uh, this done. Well, they don't do it when they meet you on the streets, but they do it during their cultural performances. Okay, uh, so there are many common gods and goddesses uh, between them, as I've already kind of mentioned here in the South Pacific. Uh, so everything is by storytelling, uh, dancing, songs. Uh, this is all part of it, okay? Memory, very, very important. Uh, if you know that the only way that the next generation is going to remember you or know about your history, if you don't have books, if you don't have writing, you memorize it, okay? So that's what's important here, okay? So they tell kind of the cultural history here. Uh, here's a, another performance. What you're seeing here is uh, a smaller performance. This was not the traditional festival that you'll see later. Uh, I did attend um, four days of a cultural festival that occurs only every two years. Uh, Maori groups from all over the islands come and they compete. Um, each group is about 15 minutes, uh, 15 to 20 minutes. And uh, then at the end, there's judges who decide who won for that year. Uh, what you're seeing here in the background is a smaller group. Uh, this would be more what uh, we, I guess we would call touristy, right? This is where you have people coming uh, to watch these shows. There's not nearly the number of people that you'll find in an actual competition, but nevertheless, very interesting. They stick to the main script, they use the Maori language, and they use the same traditional um, format. Uh, and you can see the type of dresses here. Uh, they're done um, in terms of the, the ladies in the culture. Okay, the importance of oral tradition. And I have to stress this over and over again. Um, in Maori societies, as in other societies, uh, we have to have memory, okay? And this is a quote. Uh, you can read through that yourself. Uh, this is from a 1978 publication by Orwell. Um, but the point is here um, that people who have an oral tradition actually prefer it sometimes over uh, the written language. Um, again, uh, just a shot of, of people in performance. Um, you'll later be seeing a more active scenes of, of something like this, but you can get an idea of the dress, uh, an idea of the way they sometimes will paint their body. Um, and etc. So, this is just a quote uh, from a, a local person, uh, basically saying that the, we in the West teach one thing. Uh, we teach the world is round, right, and right. But in their culture, they were taught it was flat. Uh, remember, around the world, uh, we have run across many cultures, like the Scandinavians and the Incas, who taught that the world is flat. Uh, but they never, he goes on to say they never explain how thick it is. Uh, but then he goes to say that it's kind of surrounded by sand, like a beach, right? That makes sense if you live on an island. And then uh, beyond that is space. Um, a little bit about Maori customs. Uh, uh, tinganga is the word for cultural, culture, Maori culture, basically. Uh, Deals not so much with uh, rules and regulations, but with values uh, uh, of the, to the people. Uh, they prefer to kind of self-regulate themselves because they have their own cultural values. This sometimes puts them in a little competition with the traditional government of the Europeans, but they, they tend to work that out all right. Um, so basically, um, you can see they pass on the ideas of the names of the relatives, uh, it brings everybody together. Um, then we have a sacred life force uh, in, in terms of this. And you'll see that in the, one of the videos where the, the ladies and the men shake their hands like this when they're performing. It's supposed to bring out the, this sacred life force. Um, and basically, um, we have a word that uh, means uh, the idea that a child's born with a, a, a 
an idea of a spirit, uh, the idea of a spirit. Again, uh, looking at a picture here, uh, you can see uh, what this, this fellow is, uh, what I guess he's representing a Maori warrior. He's even got feathers. Reminded me a lot of an American Indian when I saw this picture. Um, again, this relationship between different groups coming and going. Uh, we, I think at this point we don't really know how close these people are related. Uh, Maori culture continued. Uh, so basically they're, they're saying that uh, part of you is immortal. Uh, then we have, sometimes it can warn you, the soul can warn you of a problem. Um, they believe that it remains with them until very near death. Uh, and then if it's permitted, a special ceremony is performed, uh, allowing the spirit to leave. Um, there is a ceremony for the dawn. Uh, there's one mountain at the tip of New Zealand uh, on the North Island. Uh, where there's uh, big carvings and everything, and this is where the dawn ceremony was held. Um, so you can see the important things here in terms of ceremonies, the welcoming ceremony. Um, we, I wanted just to tell you a little story here about it. Um, we basically went to uh, a performance where uh, I was elected honorary chief. Uh, this is part of a traditional welcoming ceremony, and they can't believe they can't begin the dancing and the singing until uh, they go through the ceremony. This is common everywhere. There's always a ceremony. Uh, in the ceremony, basically, uh, before uh, they called me a chief, I don't know what that meant, uh, but before the chief can go in and the rest of the people can go into the performance hall, uh, a warrior has to come out and kind of try to scare you, uh, make ugly faces at you. He has a spear, he points at you. Uh, and if, and I was told that you can't take your eyes off of his eyes because it will show that you're afraid. So uh, concentrating on his eyes, uh, he goes through a whole bunch of dancing basically to scare you, um, swinging the little, his spear close to your head and everything. But then eventually he backs off and he puts down a, a palm leaf and that represents the fact that you've been accepted. Uh, and then you can go into the performing hall uh, and of course you get seated in a place of honor. Uh, later on, um, you go up on the stage and you greet every performer and the way you greet a performer or the way the Maori people greet is to put their forehead against your forehead and your, their nose against your nose. And you do it twice, okay? And then you go to the next performer and when you're done, then the actual con performance can start. Uh, I, was, I was in uh, New Zealand with my wife, of course, and uh, she's allowed to come uh, right behind you. She can never step in front of you. Uh, so anyway, I don't know if my wife appreciated that or not, but there you are. Uh, this was uh, the actual, uh, the lady that led the ceremony that kind of told me what to do and, and all that sort of thing. So we're going to look now a little more closely at what's called uh, Waiata. Uh, these are the songs uh, which tell stories, which record their history. Um, and basically when the Maoris arrived, uh, they taught they brought with them their legends, their mythology, and then they used songs and dance to keep them going. And, uh, and we mentioned Hawaii before. Uh, basically, this is where they, their traditional homeland came from. Uh, this was the actual festival. Uh, the, uh, the picture you're seeing was taken basically from um, uh, bleachers. Uh, this is kind of like a soccer field, which was converted into a performance hall then for this, uh, this four-day festival. Uh, I think there were like 30,000 Maori in town for this celebration. You couldn't find a hotel room. I made a mistake of, of making, getting my tickets for the celebration and forgetting to make hotel reservations. Two months before I tried, I couldn't get a hotel anywhere, so we ended up in an Airbnb. Uh, was the only thing available uh, to stay in, basically. Uh, 
Here's a, just a statement. I kind of liked it. It's from 1979. Uh, transplanted, transplanted with new stands, the Maori sang his greatest song. He sang, he sang of his home country, Hawaii. He sang of his voyage and his kinfold left on the islands of Moana Nui Akiwa. He sang uh, two of the stars that guided him to the land of peace and plenty. Um, so everything is recorded in song, basically. Here's a clip uh, that we're going to play. Uh, now this is my own recording. You'll see a better clip later uh, if we could start the clip now. Okay, I wanted to show you this, that clip uh, mainly because uh, it gives you an idea of how vast this performance was and how many people were there. Uh, that I was filming from the bleachers, so the bleachers would have been full, uh, like if you go into a football game and the people in the front uh, basically are there because they can, uh, they have to sit in the sun all day, unfortunately, but it's, uh, it's free <laughs> if you're willing to sit in the sun all day. And they like it better because you can get close, closer to the stage. And uh, I understand that people came as early as four in the morning in order to be able to sit up right next to the stage. Um, so kind of interesting uh, in terms of just that. Uh, so basically this idea of the Wayata is retelling of history. Uh, they're connected to basically stories containing ancient history. Uh, Oriori uh, were composed for children, particularly of high birth, so that they would know their lineage. Uh, you know, the son of the chief and chief and the chief and all that. Um, so it also makes references to many incidents in tribal history. Popo is one uh, example. I'm going to give you just a little example here. Um, and it's preserved in this form that we call Wai Ata. So, Basically, again, just a picture of the performance hall where all these things took place up front there uh, of, of the stage. Um, here's the example. Um, my son, Tama, is crying for food. Wait until he's fetched from the pillars of netted food. And the whale is driven ashore to give milk for you, my son. Remember the Maori people hunted whales? Uh, Verily, your ancestor, Umuku, will give freely. Now listen. Uh, the Kuamra is from the, uh, whatever this means, right? Beating cliff of the sun. Uh, you get the idea, right? And Tangaroa comes in here, god of the sea. Uh, so you, you can see here, basically, uh, they're teaching uh, the young children here about the gods and goddesses. Uh, explaining where food comes from. Uh, so this is something that's been passed down for generations. Uh, we're going to uh, have another clip here uh, that I took, and then uh, after this we'll have a, uh, a, a professional clip uh, that will come after this one. <laughs> Okay, so you've got an idea there of several things that were happening. Uh, basically, uh, you notice the shaking of the hands uh, uh, to free the, the Maori spirit, uh, the spirit of life, so to speak. Um, 
you saw how one group will come out onto the stage to perform and then they'll be, uh, they do five different numbers, different pieces, and then they include all the different traditions. Uh, one would be like, kind of like, I guess we would call it a love song. Uh, one would be with the uh, storytelling with song. One would be in, a couple would be in the dance form. Um, they just, they, they varied during the performance. They had a freedom of choice, basically. The next form we want to look at uh, is called a haka, uh, sometimes called hookah, but the, I like the, the, this seemed to be a closer to the pronunciation, it's called a haka. Uh, this is what we call a posture dance, uh, and quite often done by groups. Uh, the ones you'll see will be in groups. Um, no, today it's almost all males, uh, but females can also do it. And as we talked a little bit about earlier, it's, it's, this was initially done by warriors before a battle, uh, basically to scare their enemies, to illustrate their strengths, to show how strong they are, all that kind of stuff. Um, we, uh, you can see, you'll see coming up uh, facial contortions are used, the, the showing the white of the eyes I mentioned before, sticking the tongue out, and also that we didn't talk about, slapping of the body, feet stamping, uh, if they have a stick, hitting it on the ground. Lots of action. The men uh, are really, uh, in all the performances, they're very, they're very much in shape. They may look large, but they're strong people um, and must have been good warriors. Uh, mythologically, the sun god, um, had two wives, a summer maid uh, and the winter maid. Um, and according to legends, uh, Haka originated in the coming of, of the, the winter, the um, summer, summer gun. I throw this slide in just for fun because I know you've all seen The Hobbits, right? Uh, we got to go to the Hobbit village. Uh, what happened was uh, after they finished filming, uh, it was kind of like all styrofoam and uh, they were just going to kind of destroy it. Uh, there was a group of people that wanted to preserve it and the government got involved and the landowner got involved. Well, make a long story short, today it's the most, it's the most well, it's the most attractive attraction <laughs> in New Zealand uh, for tourists, right? They reconstructed the whole Hobbit village exactly the way it was in the video, in the movie. And you can go there and you can go by every Hobbit hole, every Hobbit house. Uh, and then they all const also constructed the, uh, the tavern. Um, and they, they basically give a, you a dinner there. Uh, it's, it's just kind of interesting. By the way, uh, you can't go in, the Hobbit, this one looks like you can go inside, but you really can't go inside. Uh, they're not made to be gone into. It's, the gardens are there and everything is there. It, it's quite interesting anyway. So the tourists today love, from all over the world, I think there were more people from China and Japan there than any other where, any other group of people. Uh, so it's a worldwide phenomenon that the uh, New Zealand people have taken advantage of. And by the way, in order to get into this filming area, uh, they had to build roads and they didn't have enough money to build roads so the Australian government, sorry, New Zealand government, uh, used the army to build the roads in and then the director used the army guys in the, in the actual movie uh, that was filmed uh, in this as, as extras, right? So interesting story. So there you are. Uh, we're going to continue just a bit about haka, a dance. Uh, showcases basically the attributes, the strongness, physical strength. Um, and I mentioned about being able to stick out your tongue. Um, Haka is also performed for welcoming distinguished people today. Uh, and I believe the Maori uh, soccer team, the first time this was seen kind of internationally, uh, the Maori soccer team I don't know, several years ago, performed one of these dances. Um, but it's become quite important today. Uh, the Maori culture basically was disappearing. Uh, in the 1920s, uh, a man started a school of Maori art where they learned the traditional wood carving and painting. 
And that kind of sparked a revival of the Maori culture. Um, and then we have the revival of the dancing and the singing. Uh, and then we have in the, Maori, in the New Zealand school system today, the actual teaching of the Maori language in the public schools. So the white population, uh, the European population, mostly from Scotland, Ireland, and England, uh, the children are learning about the Maori culture. I think it's, it's a nice step forward. Uh, so they're very proud of their culture today and they've maintained it better than probably any other Polynesian culture. This is a scene from a, just a picture that I took of a performance. Uh, what I wanted you to really see though was an actual performance done and recorded uh, you know, professionally. Uh, of the dance of the haka. So at this point, uh, we're basically going to run a, a clip from the Maori television station of a professionally done film on haka. Okay, before I go into the next video, I wanted to say just a little bit about what you just saw, uh, because it demonstrated all the things that happened during the, the haka. Uh, basically, you saw a lot of tattoos. Uh, Maoris are famous for their tattoos. I should emphasize that all the tattoos you, you saw on the men were not there permanently. Many of them were, 
but everybody for got in preparing for this dance, they put some traditional ones on, particularly in terms of the women. Uh, you may have seen the on the face here, on the chin, look like a beard. Those are not permanent. Uh, the men don't go around looking so fierce with their painted faces either, right? This is just for the performance. But the, the tradition of, uh, of basically tattooing is very ingrained within the culture. And uh, a lot of the men uh, on stage, maybe not during this performance, but others I saw uh, were completely tattooed all over their bodies. And normally, the higher the position within the group, uh, the more the males are allowed to be uh, tattooed, even completely around uh, their rear ends, uh, basically. Uh, and the more tattoos, the more important you are. And the Maori tattoos are normally done in the traditional manner, not with needles, but with the old, you know, very painful way. So it's a sign of manhood. Uh, what I wanted to show you now, basically, is uh, my own film uh, of a traditional uh, love song. Uh, the reason I, this is important, the, these songs have gone all the way around the Pacific. Uh, I would say half of the melodies I heard I knew from my time at the University of Hawaii. Um, so basically the songs that we th I thought were Hawaiian <laughs> uh, were probably actually uh, a combination of being composed in uh, the Maori culture the Hawaiian culture, the Tahitian culture, the Samoan culture, uh, the songs are shared. But I wanted you to hear just one, uh, one love song, so I'm going to start uh, that video uh, now.
Okay, so there you saw the traditional greeting uh, with the nose and forehead touching uh, and a traditional love song uh, of the Maori people. Um, so, uh, just kind of concluding here, uh, just a picture uh, from the beach scenes. The beaches in New Zealand have to be among the nicest in the world. And the best thing is there's no people. <laughs> You go for miles and miles and, and beautiful beaches um, and no people, basically. So if you ever have a chance, um, visit New Zealand. I should sell travel posters. Anyway, that ends the lecture for today. I thank you very much, uh, and I'll see you soon. <laughs>